I have the pleasure of uh, introducing an international panel, which is one of the reasons why uh, Waypoor exists, to be able to bring uh, scholars and perspectives from different countries together. Uh, we have uh, two scholars today from, from the United States and uh, one uh, researcher and scholar from, from Russia. And the title of uh, our session this afternoon is Comparative Perspectives on Electoral Behavior. Um, survey research from Russia, Iran, United States, Mexico, and Venezuela, part one. This is actually the first half of a two-part uh, uh, presentation. Um, today we're going to be featuring, featuring research from uh, Russia um, from, and the United States. And then in our second part, which will be downstairs uh, uh, after this session, we'll be presenting research from uh, Venezuela, Mexico, and Iran. So uh, if you're in, you know, so come downstairs after you're done to the second part as well. So we get to see both parts together. Okay. So with that being said, I think we are ready to start with our first presenter and paper. I don't know if, if the presentation is up. Um, I'm uh, introduce uh, Olga Kamenchuk, who is with the Russian Public Opinion Research Center. And her co-author, um, who uh, could not be uh, here today, is uh, Director uh, Valery Fedorov of the Russian uh, Public Opinion Research Center, Director General of the Russian Public Opinion Research Center, um, Visium. And their uh, title of their paper is Sanctions First Elections, Motivated Reasoning, Economic Perceptions, and Electoral Choice in Modern Russia. Thank you. Thank the you. The study Eric. that we are conducting also jointly with some colleagues from Texas. Um, and uh, we, continue, we are planning to continue the study. This is just the first, um, the first start, the first presentation of this data, uh, which I would be very glad to discuss with you some of the findings that we would like to share with you. Okay. Um, so, um, the basis for uh, my presentation, the basis for this study, is economic voting hypothesis, um, focusing on support for incumbent parties or so politicians um, being dependent upon evaluations of retrospective sociotropic non-personal economic performance. There are several points and several issues which I would like to name here before we proceed. Uh, first one is negative economic performance more being more predictive than positive. Primarily, most part of uh, this hypothesis, this theory, has been tested in, West, in the West. Uh, developed democracies, there has been some studies uh, in Poland, Hungary, some of the Eastern European countries, uh, some of the newer democracies, but not as much as in, in the so-called developed democracies, uh, traditional democracies. Um, and uh, economic valuations are subjective, and partisanship may condition economic perceptions. That's uh, within the motivated reasoning uh, factor, and we will talk a little bit about that as well. Oh, the, we, we are limited with time, so there is plenty of issues to discuss. I hope some of them will be touched upon during the question period. Okay, um, as for post-communist countries, and in general, Eastern Europe and former Soviet space, um, evidence has been mixed whether economic voting is applicable to uh, this area, with, uh, which is um, marked by emerging political systems and economies, um, especially given that currently, um, actually, this area is grouped, but rather historically, post-communist or post-Eastern Bloc, but these, lots of these countries, over 20, they actually took very divergent paths and they have very divergent realities currently. Uh, most studies on, those, on this region were conducted in 1990s, early 1990s, and early 2000s. The research has identified unemployment rate as more predictive than GDP change. Voters were found to be less tolerant of unemployment than high inflation. And as to applicability to political systems with low standing dominant parties and weak electoral competition, this point is pretty questionable. Uh, let's look at some Russian data um, as we are considering Russian keys in this, uh, in this uh, instance. Uh, here we present uh, to you a um, light blue line uh, denotes monthly inflation, inflation rate, light purple quarterly GDP growth rate, oh, uh, light, light, light purple monthly unemployment rate, 
um, blue quarterly GDP growth rate, and then on top, the top line, the black one, is economic satisfaction. Um, it's pretty much a mixture of um, curves based on data from Russian Statistical Agency and uh, the polls about which I'm going to talk about later. Um, the interesting part here, and again I will talk about this more, is that you no might notice that uh, starting with March 2014, the black line, which denotes economic satisfaction, as other uh, indices of social, political, and economic well-being in Russia went sig uh, significantly up, jumped up, and only beginning the end of 2015, early 2016, they started to go down and still didn't quite reach the number or the level which uh, we observed uh, throughout 2014 and earlier. But here uh, we uh, took this period of time. Okay, as for hypothesis and research questions. Our hypothesis and research questions operate across levels of analysis. The first hypothesis is that negative macroeconomic performance will reduce probability of voting for incumbent parliamentary party. Well, in, the, in our case, United Russia. The second one is that individual negative economic evaluations will be associated with a lower probability of voting for incumbent parliamentary party. Well, again, United Russia. And the research question um, based on that is, uh, is the relationship between political orientations and intention to vote for incumbent party are contingent on microeconomic performance uh, or, or not? The methodology which was used. Um, well, common approach in the previous studies and the previous literature is uh, time series analysis of macroeconomic indicators, which predict incumbent vote share over several elections. There is yet another pretty popular approach um, that's based on cross-sectional surveys that evaluate how subjective economic perceptions predict voting behavior. We decided to combine both. Uh, that's a hybrid that we suggest, which combines elements of time series analysis with cross-sectional survey analysis using HLM, multi-level modeling. <clears throat> uh, some more detail on the methodology and the data which was collected for the study. Uh, we used secondary data, it was a secondary data analysis of monthly surveys which were conducted by VCOM, Russian Public Opinion Research Center. Uh, the data was collected between, well, it was collected actually earlier, but the one used uh, is between January 2014 and June 2016. That's another reason why I used the, uh, the data from Russian Statistical Agency for those, for that period of time. Um, Two levels. The first one is uh, 30 surveys between this period of times, monthly. And the second one is, well, individual, uh, 48,000 people in the, uh, in the sample that we used. Each survey measured social demographics, age, gender, level of education, the typical standard uh, questions which are present in any pretty much omnibus study. Economic perceptions and satisfaction with current state previously and the future perceptions or expectations. Uh, political satisfaction and approval. Uh, satisfaction with current politics and political regime as well as approval of current political leaders and parties. And parliamentary vote intention. We would ask people to say who would they vote for in case the voting would take, elections would take place the coming Sunday, the closest Sunday. Again, the pretty much typical standard question used by uh, us and our colleagues uh, to measure this um, topic. We coded three macroeconomic indicators. Uh, monthly inflation rate, as I showed you, there was a reason why. Monthly unemployment rate and uh, quarterly GDP growth rate. Uh, and uh, here are our findings in short. You see model one, which denotes the objective data, the data, uh, economic statistical data. Model two, um, it's in the second column, denotes subjective evaluations. That's individual satisfaction and approval about which I mentioned just before. And model three denotes the interaction between uh, the subjective economical statistics and, uh, and then the, object, uh, the, the subjective evaluation. So there's two type of variables. Um, first of all, uh, GDP growth versus and political satisfaction. Well, it wasn't a big surprise 
to us, and some, in some way it was uh, intuitive, that um, the, liar, the higher, the lower GDP growth, uh, the less um, political satisfaction, the higher GDP growth, the higher political satisfaction. You see the differences in C seven points, pretty high. As to inflation, the data was quite interesting to us as researchers and, and caused some debates about uh, interpretation and understanding of this, uh, this information. Have a look. Uh, light blue column denotes low inflation uh, months, well, relatively low inflation months, and dark blue high inflation months. The first group of columns denotes those people who approve of Mr. Putin, and the um, two right columns denote those people who disapprove of President Putin. Interestingly, um, regardless of whether people approve or disapprove, um, inflation seems to be um, causing, so to say, uh, influencing their uh, approval uh, towards, uh, regard, regardless of the um, their position on uh, Mr. Putin in general, inflation seems to be affecting the approval level. However, in cases, uh, on those cases when people approve President Putin, the, the difference is higher than among those who disapprove of Mr. Putin. So inflation seems to be, instead of causing disapproval, growing disapproval, uh, seem to be causing quite the opposite, approval uh, for the uh, incumbent party and Mr. Putin. So briefly, uh, again, conclusions. What you found, unemployment and low GDP growth decreased voter support for incumbent party, but uh, high inflation increased support. Um, this caused uh, a question, could high inflation move voters to incumbent party due to fears of in political instability? W does this mean that people are looking for more stability, especially uh, having all these fears and experience with 1990s and uh, turbulent period of time there? And um, could this affect? Another um, idea we had while discussing the, these findings was the effect of uh, sanctions. Uh, towards Russia, um, which pretty much means whether people really hold uh, their government and their leaders responsible for the inflation, whether they thought that uh, those is, this is not the, uh, the, the government, the governmental uh, job, poor job, for, for example, but the anti-Russian sanctions which would be working. Um, one more point, beyond macroeconomic performance, subjective economic and political evaluations influenced voter support for incumbent party. Uh, evaluation of and satisfaction with current economic conditions were predictive. Retrospective evaluation of inflation was not. Uh, macroeconomic performance interacts with political partisanship um, and subjective evaluations. Uh, high inflation amplified the relationship between presidential approval and voter selection of United Russia, and the relationship between political satisfaction and voting the, uh, for United Russia is contingent upon past GDP growth and current employment rates. I'm very, I tried to be very quick because I had a sign of a couple of minutes left. Finally, moving toward, that's the most interesting part for us because as I said, we are just at the beginning um, of, of this big study we are studying. First of all, um, we'd like to probe the reasons why high inflation um, may counterintuitively increase support for United Russia. This is not something we expected. And by the way, other studies in Eastern European countries didn't demonstrate the same pattern. Uh, we would like to check whether this data is an artifact unique to 2015. And we definitely would like to add more data uh, for 2012-2013 to the model and uh, to see uh, whether, exact, whether indeed this Olympic Games, Crimea, uh, victory celebrations and Syria um, um, campaign affected this satisfaction and indices, which, because indeed Crimean effect was very strong and affected all indices um, um, that, we, uh, that we measured. Um, also, we would like to see whether additional survey work is needed to examine voters' mental associations between United Russia and government and inflation. Um, the second point, uh, we would like to examine individual level relationships between subjective economic evaluations and partisanship, political evaluations, and influence 
on vote choice. Uh, for example, do partisan attitudes toward politicians or government influence how voters see the economy and in turn in their vote choice? Um, do they acknowledge what they actually see? Do they hold the government responsible for what is going on? And um, um, so we would like to study perception of economy versus knowledge of economy. And finally, examine uh, mediation pathways in direct effects. How is macroeconomic influence on uh, um, vote choice mediated by economic and political evaluations? And what may be role of media information sources on economic evaluation. So that's the tasks for the future, which we will um, start, try to address um, uh, after our first uh, start. Okay, thank you very much. I <laughs> tried to be very quick to fit in this uh, small period of time. Uh, I'm very much looking forward for, to your questions. Okay, thank you, Olga, for uh, staying on time. I think we have about uh, 15 minutes for uh, questions, maybe a little less, 12 minutes, because we started a little, little late. Um, do we have any questions for Olga about her paper? Oh, yeah, please, please go ahead. Um, I wonder, well, thank you very much for the um, speech. Well, I wonder how you're going to measure the influence of Crimea and all geopolitical facts that have happened with our country. Uh, if it's going to be by media, or maybe you're going to make some kind of qualitative research on it. I wonder, I mean, because I don't really understand how to measure the real influence and whether, um, I mean, I know how to possibly um, understand the influence of geopolitical facts, but how to understand if exactly these affected uh, these facts. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, we know exact dates when uh, Crimea happened, when uh, Olympic Games were taking place, when Victory Day was celebrated in Russia. We also know, um, we, I showed you the graph uh, of changes uh, in GDP, in inflation, as well as perceptions, political perceptions. Our graph demonstrates, um, just once again, and it's a um, short period of time, is if you see the first, well, we, I, I'm, I'm talking about the black line, the first point you know, it's January 2014, and then February 2014, that's already, um, that's already um, Olympic Games, and March 2014 is Crimea. All indices, as I, as I remember our data, and I think it's, I'm pretty accurate on that, went up. Not only Sion data, but our colleagues as well. We do have a um, hypothesis that this did affect this event. Uh, our colleagues from other centers, I think Elena Koneva was talking about this as well. She brought up this idea. So yes, media uh, is one uh, point to study because that's one of the major uh, informant for the population. Uh, Russian people, but not only Russian people, people in general can form their position on uh, some economical issues based on their experiences. They come to the store, they see the prices, um, the changes in prices, but as, to, as it comes to foreign policy, pretty much they judge from what they see on TV. They are not uh, foreign policy specialists. So I think media is very important here, but that's not, not the only important point. We are currently starting uh, a new study um, within uh, Synapse, uh, uh, Comparative National Elections Project. Um, it's a long time uh, international comparative study conducted since 1990s uh, in, um, in, all co in four continents of the world. Russia is joining and we're going to conduct a study in October. Based, it will be a post-electoral study, but we want to include foreign policy as well because that's a very important question, uh, especially now for Russia. And I think some of these issues we might touch upon. But not only, I hope um, Tsiom uh, will cooperate uh, jointly with uh, the team of researchers from Ohio State University and Texas, University of State, Texas, and we will continue uh, and use some more data. We are eager to provide additional data for more studies. Thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, Eric can add as oh, well because he's part of the team actually. Well, I just, just to answer your question from a statistical viewpoint, the, the modeling we use is something called uh, hierarchical linear modeling or multi-level modeling. So um, what it does is it looks at the contextual influence of each month is a unit of analysis. So what we can do is code those events 
that uh, Olga mentioned, uh, Victory Day, Sochi, et cetera, into the model. And if we code those events in the model and we see the reduction of the influence of inflation as a predictor, we know that those events are carrying part of the variance that inflation is influencing. So the idea is to control for those events and see whether inflation is still predictive of vote choice statistically. That's, that's how we might approach that. That's something where we, we just started to think about that. This is our first attempt at creating a statistical model, and now we have to work on refining it. Yes, I think there was one more question from our colleague. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Anna Shurkan of High School of Economics in Petersburg. Uh, following up that, uh, uh, that comment of yours on, on the model, I'd like to add that. Uh, I think it's, it was 2016 paper in ESJ where they have uh, shown that uh, with uh, such models where you have the logistics regression, uh, the minimum number of uh, uh, contextual units should be above, uh, about 35, I guess, uh, because otherwise you will get very uh, unreliable errors. So my, my, my question will be, I mean, as long as we're waiting for more month to come mm -hmm. and to uh, enrich the model, uh, did you have any robustness checks uh, for your findings? Because this is quite striking findings, so probably you could uh, have some counterfactual, you know, or factuals, which, which would other um, other explanations that would support your model, given that uh, uh, as, uh, for the time being, well, 30 units of a high order is probably not enough to make any, you know, substantive conclusions. Thanks. We uh, do plan, plan to include, um, uh, at le it will be probably if we include two more years uh, before that, and then we plan to include uh, six, uh, 2016 till the end, that will be totally uh, over 60, actually, uh, polls, so over 60 months that we will study for about, it will be probably around four or five years of, of, monthly, mm -hmm. of monthly data. Um, the sample size, individual, individual sample size will increase twice, over twice, I think over 100,000 people, yeah. And uh, respectively, I would um, disagree with that 35 number. As someone who's published a great deal of HLM and multi-level models, cross-country analyses, um, I think 30 is actually, um, you know, it, again, more, more units would be better, more power, obviously. Um, but with only two or three level two variables, um, in most cases, 30 units is sufficient uh, for testing. Obviously, as Olga said, we're going to be adding, uh, now that we serve- sort of Twice as more. Yeah, we'll be adding twice more, and we'll be actually taking a look at this to see whether, again, adding more uh, units of time, increasing the length of our examination, whether that holds up or not, is a open question. So that is, we're not, this is not, this is a first step. But at the same time, I think that 35 number, I have probably, equal number of statisticians at OSU that would disagree with that. So <laughs> I, I think that's not necessarily a hard number or criteria to go by. Thank you very much. Okay, I guess. Uh, any other questions, please? Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, Olga. We'll be moving on to the next paper then. So our second presenter today is uh, Poris Bora, Dr. Poris Bora from uh, Washington State University. And she presenting a paper based upon data from the 2012 presidential election, uh, framing in Twitter, uh, framing in the Twitter sphere, strategic versus issue frames in the 2012 U.S. presidential elections. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm presenting on something uh, which is a little different from what you've seen so far. It's not <laughs> based on survey data. Uh, it does talk um, about public opinion, so, um, but in the Twitter sphere. So we look at, I, I look at tweets. Um, so why it is becoming important uh, to understand um, information that is there in places, in forums like Twitter, is 81% um, um, of the U.S. population, this is uh, this is uh, stats from from the U.S. Um, they get their information online, and and out of that, 62% actually is is from social media, and this becomes uh, really crucial uh, during ele election uh, cycle, during di during um, political campaigns. <clears throat> And uh, the social, me uh, social media sites are not just uh, for, um, you know, not, not just for, a not a place for uh, receiving, but it's also for disseminating information. Um, so it is tool for ordinary citizens like us uh, to express their, to express uh, views, views online. 
Um, so the primary, sort of the primary question in the, in the study was to look at what, um, sort of what kind of frames are used by ordinary citizens um, to, to, talk, to talk about ele elections, to talk about the political campaign um, during the 2012 cycle. Sorry, I keep moving. Uh, um, so those of you who are not familiar with, that, with, with framing, it's, it's something that's been very commonly used to study sp uh, in political communication, especially uh, election, election campaigns. Um, there are many ways to define um, framing, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but um, there are two sort of uh, ways of uh, understanding framing. One is sociological, one is psychological. Sociological being where we talk about the frames which are uh, in content. To, you know, it could be media content or, or uh, in, in communication content. Uh, and the other, psychological, is more looking at the influence of these frames on, on, on audience. Um, again, uh, news framing, it, it, it has been com very commonly used for uh, understanding political campaigns, election coverage. And a um, lot of different types of frames have been identified uh, in the literature. And um, it's a really big literature. I'm just touching, I'm just presenting some of this here. Um, positive and negative frames, hype versus substance. Um, and uh, two of the m main uh, commonly used in, in, in terms of uh, campaign is actually strategy uh, versus issue frames. And it has been studied uh, a lot, uh, a lot in, in election, in election uh, campaigns. Uh, strategy frame, which is um, coverage of election uh, information in, in terms of winning or losing. So uh, any, any policy decision, um, anything that you're talking about, it's interpreted in the, in the terms that they're, you know, the, the campaign is doing this because of, for winning this particular vote, voter um, um, votes or, you know, something in, in that, in that sort of way. Uh, whereas issue frames uh, is more, it, it deals more with the actual uh, policies and uh, policies of the candidates or it highlights the problems and, and possible solutions and so it's more, uh, more in-depth, more, more analysis and more critics. Um, that's uh, sort of how they are defined in, in the literature. Um, so there's also this lot of literature on horse race coverage. So a lot of the campaign coverage, especially in the presidential elections, um, has been primarily strategic in the, uh, in the US. And I'm, again, all of this is coming from the US uh, uh, literature. And uh, <clears throat> So one of the questions, because now we have so much data from the public, as you know, especially in places like Twitter or, or Facebook, where um, people are talking about politics all of, all the time, and so how how do they sort of the question is how do they talk about politics online? Um, is it similar to how we've been seeing media campaigns um, through through the eyes of the media or or political campaigns through, for, for in the media coverage, or is it is it different from how 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 we've seen it? So that was kind of the primary question, and there are four uh, different questions that I looked at in this study. Uh, one being, of course, what is the most prominent frame um, in the tweets or uh, in in, the, in uh, tweets of the public in 2012 uh, elections, uh, what are the more, more, most common topics uh, and issues that were found in the tweets, and then what is the tone of this of the tweets, um, and uh, what were the most commonly used framing devices? So when I say framing devices, I mean um, um, uh, what are the different uh, devices used to frame a study? So in, in, in media, we, in, in media coverage, we usually see, we say headlines or uh, we see images or, or the story or the paragraph. Those are kind of used to, to frame a uh, um, particular study, but a particular, sorry, particular um, article. But that is different when you, when you're talking about 140 characters in, in Twitter. So, um, so that was one of the questions to, to, to kind of look at. So this is a very, again, like I said, it's a very preliminary study which was done, uh, which based on some of the results from here, actually I'm using it, now I'm using uh, for 2016 elections uh, for a more comprehensive study. Um, <clears throat> so analysis of tweets from, uh, from the last year's uh, elections, uh, presidential, presidential elections, and um, the tweets which were used um, using hashtags of elections 2012, campaign 2012, Obama, Romney, uh, presidential elections 2012. These are all common ha hashtags which were found, and, and these were the search items uh, kind of used uh, to, to, to identify tweets. Um, they were collected using a program called Topsy Pro, um, and that's actually no longer exists. This was, um, <laughs> and uh, it was used for that. Um, so the final sample was between September 3rd 
uh, to November 6th, which is a very common sort of duration that is used for media campaign, sorry, uh, media coverage of political um, uh, ele election, election campaign uh, that has been used uh, in several studies. And um, so top 300 tweets, according to Topsy's top tweets, were, were identified. Um, these were fine, the, the tweets that were finally um, content analyzed were 3,000, and it, this is again a, a sampling of, of the millions of tweets which were there. Um, that was one of the limitations, and I'll talk about that as well, because it was manually coded, so it was not, uh, not a um, computer program used to content analyze, so manually coded, so it was not possible to uh, code everything that was available. Um, the variables used were framed topic, tone, and framing device. Uh, we did an in integral reliability. Um, and so it included only the ordinary uh, individual accounts, so which, by which I mean there are uh, <clears throat> um, different um, sort of scholars have identified the different types of um, tweets that we see uh, online and uh, in Twitter. And um, the five main types which have been described are celebrities, uh, media agencies, or other organizational accounts, bloggers, and ordinary uh, individual accounts. So everything else except ordinary individual accounts were not included in this. And so what uh, the first um, sort of research question was, what was the most prominent frame? And it was overwhelmingly issue framed, and which is kind of the almost the opposite of what we see in media coverage, which is mostly strategy frame. So this was one of the things that kind of was uh, very interesting and um, something that I want to explore more, obviously, with more of a better, better sample. Um, issues were highest on, uh, in people's uh, mind were economy, uh, followed by healthcare, immigration, uh, gun control, gay rights, and foreign policy, and a couple of other um, issues which were, which were quoted as other, uh, <clears throat> which was quite um, quite similar to what the media coverage or media issues that were covered in the media as well. Uh, framing devices, one of the most common were hashtags that were identified, keywords, images, hyperlinks, um, different charts and graphs. Um, tone, um, not neutral, right? So it's not like the media uh, tone that we see in media coverage, the tone that we mostly see is mostly objective or neutral, that in, in depending on where you go for uh, uh, for your source. But um, here, majority of the uh, public, general public tweeted were uh, in favor of one of the candidates, and, and very emotional actually at that. In, you know, it's either a lot of love or, or a lot of hatred. So it's, it's very emotional and not, not, not neutral at all. Um, <clears throat> so some of the conclusions from the study, uh, media frames versus frames that were identified uh, as, as the public frames, um, different really. So very, um, the public had talked, they, they tweeted mostly about issues, all, all different types of, different kinds of issues, and economy was, was very, very high in the agenda for, for, for the public, whereas that's not always the case with, with, uh, with they would talk a lot about uh, in terms of strategy. Um, the issue as terms, uh, the, the types of issues were the same, mostly the same. Um, tone, again, like I said, it was not neutral and different from how we see, uh, you know, objective media coverage, again. Uh, and the framing de devices were also different from when we talk about um, framing devices used in media coverage, because these are, again, very different, because we have 140 characters in, in Twitter versus a news story, um, which has, you know, different paragraphs and, 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 and headings and other, other sorts of things. So those were also, also quite different. So as I said, limitations, yes, definitely a lot of limitations. It's a preliminary testing. Uh, sampling was a huge issue. I did not have, um, access to that the entire the comp the entire data and that is um, if if it, those of you who work with twitter you would know getting the twitter data is one of the most difficult part unless you have a lot of money uh, it's it's difficult to get the data uh, to get a comprehensive sample you can get some but not not all not all the uh, not all the tweets but this was one of the good things was that these were the top so these were these were the ones which were retweeted most or trending most so these were um, uh, that was uh, that was one of the reasons why these were chosen um, so 
That was one of the bigger problems of the study because the sampling was, was not comprehensive. But I'm currently collecting data for uh, 2016 with, with um, uh, colleagues from Atlanta and um, uh, friends I've used uh, uh, that I've worked with uh, using Node Excel, where we've, we will be getting a more comprehensive um, sort of um, sample. And um, that will include all tweets from, uh, from important dates, such as the debates and over the period of the whole election cycle uh, of 2016. Um, that will make it uh, sort of possible to compare um, the frames and other issues and other variables that we'll be looking at um, within clusters. So maybe, um, maybe for example, political ideology is a different as Republican versus Democrats. Are they, are they using different frames or, uh, you know, that kind of a thing is possible if we have more um, that kind of data. And it'll also be possible to do some visualizations of, of the clusters if we have, uh, uh, if we have the data and, and, and through Node Excel. Um, and then the content analysis of the tweets, of course, will not be manual this time because it'll be it'll be done through um, a, a different uh, a software program. So that's uh, that's sort of how uh, that's the plan for for the future for the study. Thank you. So uh, questions uh, for uh, Dr. Bora? Yes, please. Um, I wondered if you might uh, riff a bit on explaining what does Twitter, in your opinion, tell us about American public opinion? Uh, you showed that you know 80% of Americans are getting their news through social media, but the people who are on Twitter is a very small subset of that. If I remember correctly, I think it's like 15 or 20% of the American public is on Twitter, and the people that are on Twitter are very different from the people that are not on Twitter. So. How does you know, understanding what's going on on Twitter give us an insight into American public opinion? What would you say about that? That's, yeah, that's, a, very good, that's a very good question. Thank you. That's uh, possibly one of the limitations I should have pointed out, that it's a slice of that audience, right? It's not the entire public, not the entire public obviously. It's that, it's that unique um, sort of um, um, audience that goes to that goes to Twitter or uses Twitter um, regularly, and as you pointed out, and you pointed out correctly, that not everybody is on Twitter or not everybody is tweeting. But this uh, study is obviously about the people who are on Twitter and how they are talking about politics. But it is interesting because there's more and more uh, people using Twitter, and and uh, one of the for 2016, one of the candidates for our uh, for our elections, um, Donald Trump, if you've heard of him, uh, he's used Twitter so much. And he's, he's actually, uh, it, it is a unique case that uh, somebody who um, came to interview me about, about the elections recently, a week ago, asked me about Donald Trump and said, how do you explain his use of Twitter? I said, I actually have no idea, I, I, you know. But he's, and other, more and more um, politicians are using uh, forums like Twitter. And, I, and you're absolutely right, like I said, that this is, of course, that particular um, group of people who are using and that the study is only about that and not about the bigger audience. Thanks. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, ben Dattenberg from NTU in Singapore. Um, that's a good question. I was going to follow up with that. You said it, it, the tone is not neutral. It's Twitter. Yes. Okay? I mean, there's a lot of snark and other kinds of things on there. Some people do get their information. And I was wondering to what extent you were going to be looking at perhaps informational tweets versus, you know, affective. Uh, perhaps looking at the use of irony, if you're looking at hashtags. Um, again, just ask you to talk a little bit more about where you might go with this in the future uh, along those lines, recognizing the limitations and accepting those and moving on. So what is it about Twitter that, that can really help us better understand political, uh, public opinion in the context of a political election? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. It's um, <laughs> It's, it's a difficult question because even as moving forward, when I think about it, because uh, the, the 2016 election uh, uh, sample that we are going to look at, uh, it'll be even more difficult to actually differentiate that effect, uh, you know, those which are emotional uh, versus if uh, more info informa informative. Uh, we might be able to do that to some extent, and that's one of the things we definitely want to do because um, uh, we looked at tone here uh, in this because this was a smaller sample. We could we could do that. So it'll depend on if the uh, computer 
program is going to be uh, how you know how much uh, how much we are going to be able to do that content analysis or not. But it'll be interesting to see. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's Twitter. People are people are all. Um, very emotional. They, you know, either it's a lot of love for uh, for Obama or Romney, or it's a lots lot of hate and 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 uh, incivility and you know anger and and things like that. But uh, but it's 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 interesting uh, the um, because it's very issue oriented though. It was very policy oriented rather, uh, at least in this study um, that we saw. Um, Everybody was talking about something which was very, very important to them. It seems like, and you know, issues that they are personally invested, or you know, things like that. So it was, it's interesting. So it'll be, it'll be nice to see in a bigger sample where I think I'll be more confident in making some of the claims because this is because of the small sample. It's a little bit difficult. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Larissa Pautova, Fund of Public Opinion. Короткий вопрос. Индустрия опросов общественного мнения и анализ социальных медиа – это две разные сферы в данный момент? Или есть интеграция между полстерами и теми, кто изучает социальные медиа? В России это пока достаточно автономные сферы, но мы пытаемся пересекаться, потому что опросы обогащаются за счет социальных медиа. Как сейчас в мире это разные сферы, либо они идут навстречу друг другу? Два бизнеса, две разные сферы или объединяются? Okay, I think I missed the first part of the question, but I think I got what you're asking. Um, I think that's a very interesting question um, um, that whether whether they come together or not. Um, I would say. With uh, social network analysis, in at least in the U.S., um, I don't think we have the good, we we have good methodology yet to really talk about it as as public opinion because we we simply don't have the sampling. We don't have the um, sort of the robust kind of sampling that we need to really understand for survey methodology because it's been used for so long. I think we've come up with lots of good ways to have a good. A good sample a sampling done for for surveys, but that's not the case with social network analysis. And it's 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 again um, as it was pointed out by the first question that this is just a slice of that audience. It's not necessarily you know. So calling it public opinion is it's 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 hard to do that. Uh, but at the same time, I think more and more scholars are looking into it and uh, and you know trying to understand um, because it is becoming so important, especially in political uh, in in election campaigns. Um, so I think in the future it will become more sophisticated, but uh, right now I think a lot of us who are doing uh, research in the area are still struggling for good methodologies. Other questions? We still have some time here. Uh, oh, go ahead, please. Thank you for giving me actually a second question. It's actually not a question, it's a, just an idea for you. You know, one thing that's really interesting on social media is the level of polarization. Uh, and now I think because, as you said, more and more people are on social media, not just Twitter, Facebook, etc. Who are they talking to and what are they talking about? It seems that they basically only talk to people who agree with them. Uh, and, and, and then the conversation just goes from there. So, so the level of polarization in social media is itself, I think, a really interesting topic of study, not because me, it tells us or it doesn't tell us something about American public opinion, but we're interested in what's going on in social media because it's social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that'll be one of the things that'll be looked into uh, for the 2016 to see how it differs by political, you know, political parties, ideologies, and independents, or, uh, you know, Republicans versus uh, versus Democrats. And that becomes, that's actually easy to do uh, if you, ha you know, if you have the whole, uh, it's very easy to do in, in visualizations and you, you absolutely get to know how the clusters form and, you know, what's going on in those, in those, Echo chambers, or how we how we like to call them. Um, so yeah, that'll be one of the things I would definitely be interested in looking uh, in the future. Uh, uh, Mita, I have a question. Uh, one substantive, one one methodological. So first, um, 
really quickly, I don't know if you did, or it would seem also be interesting for 2016 if you didn't, did you, you only focus on individual treat, uh, tweets, <laughs> tweets, did you also look at media organization tweets? Because obviously media organizations are using Twitter as a means to disseminate their own frames and news. Mm -hmm. And so have you done any comparative analysis between individual tweets and frames mm -hmm. and at least media organizations mm -hmm. or no. and or party organizations. And the second part, as someone is interested methodologically, I have 26 million tweets from Turkish election from a year ago. So my question is, uh, we're looking at how to do machine learning and coding ourselves of that of that data. Um, so how are you guys doing that? Okay. For US All right. So the first question, uh, no, for the 2012, we haven't looked at, I haven't looked at um, differences between media organizations and individual. It was just the individual. Uh, for the 2016, we are going to look at um, the different, you know, media organizations, um, politicians, and, and everything, all, all the different clusters. We're going to look at that for 2016. Um, have I found a good methodology to look at the millions of tweets that you're talking about? Um, I'm not an expert, I'll have to say that. I'm working <laughs> with the help of some other people who are doing some Twitter research and, and um, Node Excel does allow to some extent um, if you have if you have the tweets, um, at least you'll be able to have uh, see those clusters and you know yeah. through visualizations that will be possible. Um, if you want to know about the content of the of the tweets, then you'll have to do a content analysis uh, with a with a software program because you cannot do manual coding. Right, we do so you need thing. to have two different actually two different programs to do. One would be the visualizations of the tweets to figure out. Um, the different clusters or how you how you want to uh, you know break them up and second would be to actually look at the content of the tweets so that will be a separate content analysis and that that those are the two things I'll, I'll be interested in doing for 2016 yeah we, we should compare notes <laughs> um, any other questions for our speaker presenter okay thank you very much we'll move to our final presenter today um, He's from this small university in Ohio that, no, <laughs> quite the contrary, Ohio State's uh, 65,000 students. So um, second biggest in the US. So the Ohio State University, we have the pleasure of uh, Dr. William Chip Eveland, a uh, colleague of mine. And he is going to, uh, in a very provocative title, um, Signs of the American Apocalypse, uh, Signs of the American Political Apocalypse, Support for American Democracy in 2012, and its implications for 2016. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I was going to begin by saying, let me begin by painting you a picture. And then I thought, I have a better picture. Uh, we'll just put that up there. I, I do mean to be provocative in this. Um, I, and I do want to sort of set for you the impetus for this particular presentation. Um, we have some interesting things going on in the United States today with regards to politics and over the course of the past year or so. Um, and it has led scholars of public opinion, academics, political scientists, to really struggle with coming up ex with explanations of what's happening in the United States with regards to our current election campaign, but maybe politics in general as well. Um, and that is that, for those of you who, who may not be aware, um, over the past year and a half or so, uh, year, year and a half, we have had uh, outsider candidates, um, anti establishment candidates who have done very well in primary campaigns in both of the major political parties in the United States. Uh, Bernie Sanders on the left, the, the uh, candidate who went from an independent to running for the Democratic nomination, uh, and Donald Trump who went from a Democrat to a Republican to running for the Republican uh, nomination. Uh, since I submitted the proposal for this presentation, uh, Trump won the nomination and Sanders lost the nomination. Uh, but the, the idea behind this is really trying to understand how two anti-establishment, in some sense anti-system candidates, rose as high as they did during the primary campaigns, and then try to be thinking forward uh, to data collection that uh, Professor Nisbet and I and some of our colleagues at Ohio State will be gathering again in 2016. What's been going on in the US has been 
things that maybe with ideas of American exceptionalism, people in the U.S. were not quite sure that they ever thought they would see it happen on their shores. Um, political violence, uh, explicit claims by major party candidates that the election system itself is rigged. Um, profession of policy positions that tend to violate fundamental values or presumed values uh, or laws in the country. And so in April, when I submitted the, the uh, thank you, <laughs> when I submitted the uh, proposal for this conference, we didn't have a whole lot of data and uh, I wanted to try to contribute to this discussion of how can we explain what's going on. And so I thought, well, let me look back at the data that uh, Eric and I and our colleagues gathered in 2012 as part of the Comparative National Election Project and see if we can see any clues that this sort of thing might have come about. Now, interestingly enough, um, this summer, a terrific article came out in the Journal of Democracy, which kind of hits a number of the points that I will still talk about today, uh, looking at the United States as well as Europe over time, uh, showing that things that maybe people didn't think could happen so easily and weren't looking so closely in consolidated democracies are in fact happening increases actually in support for authoritarian leadership, declines in a lot of the civic values and participation that we would hope to see. And so what I'd like to see my discussion today be is an extension of this piece, looking at a particular data set right now, and then hopefully in a couple of months we'll follow up with some uh, hard data that directly applies to at least this one candidate here on the right uh, and how it relates to the notion uh, of support for democracy in a long-established democracy like the United States. Uh, so again, to briefly summarize, what I'm using uh, for this presentation are the 2012 U.S. component only of the Comparative National Elections, Elections Project, which is uh, centered in the Ohio State University in the U.S. Um, I might make some brief reflections back to the 2004 data collected by the CNEP, which largely supports the findings of the Journal of Democracy piece, and that is that things are changing as of 2012. Support for democracy is changing, it's declining in the United States. Uh, the data were gathered by GFK for us uh, online using a nationally representative sampling procedure. Um, and again, we will be gathering additional data in 2016. The first thing that I want to start with are the findings from 2012 to a relatively standard question looking at democratic support. The bar on the right, people responding, democracy is preferable to any form of government. And the three other options sometimes being combined together as essentially the non-democracy response. But what I really want to focus on here is distinguishing among the three additional possible answers. Uh, now I'll say in 2012, I argued that we should not even ask this question in the United States because there would be no variance uh, and that it was a waste of our survey time. I was wrong. I'm glad I was overruled. Um, what we see here is that yes, a large majority of US citizens agree that democracy is preferable to any form of government, but non-negligible subsets of the population endorse the potential value of an authoritarian candidate, a dictator, uh, or say that it doesn't matter, or interestingly enough, and often this is ignored, but sometimes some respondents actually simply refuse to answer this question, which I think is an also, also an important signal that we ought to look at. Uh, as I said, most of the research that I've seen groups these relatively small alternative viewpoints, alternatives to Democrat, to uh, democracy, they tend to group them together. Um, but I think it's instructive, especially in the US and especially at this time, to highlight the distinctions between holding one of these alternative viewpoints. Um, and the reason that I think this is because it may help explain why we had anti-establishment candidates from both the left and the right uh, that might fit in some extent, to some extent, into, um, into this picture of democratic attitudes. So the, the connection I'm making to 2016 here is that these anti-system, these, these candidates that are arguing that we have to reject the, uh, the status quo, 
in some ways, they're appealing to people who are having questions about the functioning of democracy in the United States. They're picking on certain aspects of people's concerns or of people's ambivalence towards the system of democracy in the United States and using that to their advantage. So let me take, uh, to begin with, to show you responses to people's thoughts in the United States about what defines democracy, what components are essential to democracy, and then highlight how that relates to people's support for democracy across these categories. So I mentioned earlier, for instance, Donald Trump uh, has made, as well as Bernie Sanders, arguments that the system, the political system in the United States is rigged. Um, and of course, we ask questions about whether or not people believe that free and fair elections are essential to democracy. And while most people agree that they're essential, there are, again, substantial portions of people who back off of that a little bit. Maybe they're not absolutely essential. Um, interestingly, we find that support for democracy varies along the uh, whether or not people think of elections, free and fair elections, are a necessity for democracy. In this case, in an odd pattern. People who do not endorse democracy are less likely to think that elections are, free and fair elections are a necessary component of elections. Um, this was kind of a surprising finding to me, but I, I should point out for all my subsequent slides, the red circle is a statistically significant difference between democracy being the pre uh, preferable form of government and uh, each of the additional response options. Moving more along the line here, we've also asked people about their attitudes towards the importance of media. And again, here, most people agree that at least important or maybe essential to have free and uncensored media for an election. Um, Donald Trump, though, in particular, has been very, a very vocal critic of the media and, in fact, has banned a number of uh, newspapers and press organizations from covering uh, his campaign at his events and so forth. So we have a candidate who is attacking essentially the value of the media system in the United States. And what we see is again, that the people who are less supportive of democracy also are not seeing free and fair media as an important component, uh, as an essential, I should say, component of democracy. Similarly, the notion of criticizing the government. Most people think you should be, uh, that this is essential to democracy to criticize government. Um, Trump sort of highlights the notion that criticism is problematic. He endorses political, well, he has endorsed political violence against people who have protested his speeches at his rallies and so forth. And again, what we see is that those who do not endorse democracy as the uh, best form of government also are less likely to um, suggest that the ability to criticize the government is an important component or an essential component of democracy. Uh, continuing on to this, jobs. How important are jobs to the de definition of democracy? Well, we see Trump is highlighting jobs, certainly. Bernie Sanders, the Democrat, also highlighting jobs in the economy is important. And we can see, and this is where my point about distinguishing between the different anti-democratic or non-democratic responses, those individuals who say the form of government doesn't matter are more important, think that providing jobs to everyone is a essential component of democracy. Whereas those who are willing to endorse the notion of a dictatorship actually think that providing jobs to everyone is less a component of democracy. And the reason that this is important is it may give a signal here to the, let's see, which is the pointer? This one? No. Uh, the, those who say that the form of government doesn't matter, I think those are folks who might have been listening more to the Democrat Bernie Sanders, uh, who think that having jobs is, uh, is just something part of the definition of government. Whereas I think those that are saying maybe it's okay to have an authoritarian leader, more likely to be those who are listening more closely to a Donald Trump in the United States. And we can see that these responses to what is the best form of government or does it matter uh, differ in terms of the criteria that are being applied. Um, income gap is another one. Again, Bernie Sanders' major uh, point of his campaign was focusing on income gaps. And we see, in fact, that those who think the form of government doesn't matter, those people really think 
equalizing income should be a central component of democracy. So I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about um, political values and how they relate to, uh, or actually even more general values, but how they relate to uh, support for democracy. One way in, in the United States that we've asked about this and elsewhere is whether or not religious beliefs should provide the basis for our laws versus uh, whether religion should basically be separate from laws. And we see that all of those who do not necessarily uh, see democracy as the best form of government are more likely to endorse the use of religion as a, uh, as a factor to contribute to the laws that are made in the country. And again, we see Donald Trump, who has used religion in a number of ways, not only uh, proposing a ban for Muslims entering the country, uh, but also sort of playing to the notion that uni the United States is a Christian nation. Um, we've also seen, uh, we can also see a distinction in the extent to which people want to defend the way of life that exists in the United States versus copy practices around the world. Now, I would have imagined that those who are more supportive of democracy would in fact want to uh, compare practices from other people around the world. It turns out it's actually just the opposite. Again, another interesting finding, but it's those people who see democracy as not the best form of government, who are actually more interested in, in taking cues from around the world. And it, it seems to me maybe it is taking cues about uh, maybe the form of government, that there are alternatives, that forms of government beyond the United States may actually work better uh, in some cases. The notion of a, of a um, a government driven by experts rather than by democratic deliberation is another point of distinction here. And we can see that those that are more supportive of authoritarian forms of government are also more willing to support a government led by uh, experts. Here again, we see a theme of Donald Trump's campaign. I'm a great businessman. I'm a multi-billionaire. I am an expert at doing this. I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do. I can go and take control, essentially in an anti-democratic fashion. Um, one last point I'll, I'll take, because I know my time is running low. Um, the anti-status quo approach that both Sanders and Trump have employed throughout their campaigns, calls in, they call into question the freeness and fairness of the election campaign. What we asked in our 2012 survey was also about if you think the election in 2012 was not free and fair, what are some of the reasons? We gave folks a list of reasons. And one of those was that private resources of, the, of rich individuals or powerful groups were unfairly used to support a party. Uh, again, there's a theme coming up here, one of Donald Trump's attacks on the last remaining uh, status quo candidate battling against him is that she is the tool of moneyed interests. Uh, and in fact, we see that actually it's more the Sanders type supporters, if you take my argument, those that see any form of government not helping people or those who refuse to answer the question who are more likely to think that it's moneyed interests that are causing problems in the freeness and fairness of our elections. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm not going to talk about the political and demographic traits that relate to support for democracy. But to just wrap up in saying that while I've framed this discussion as part of, if nothing else, my own intellectual exercise in trying to understand what is happening politically on both the left and the right in my own country, um, none of these data have any reference to people supporting any of the 2016 candidates because they were gathered in 2012. We'll have more clear data that will allow us to explicitly connect support for particular candidates to their democratic attitudes. That's something that we'll be doing in the 2016 data collection. So this is more of a thought process of figuring out what are the characteristics of those individuals who are less supportive of democracy and in what way may the candidates in 2016 have been trying to appeal to that essentially target demographic in order to achieve their political outcomes? And I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Chip. OK, questions? Yes, please go ahead. Oh. 
Yeah, a uh, question here. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, maybe um, it's not exactly about the topic of your speech, but still, uh, people do not really today understand what democracy is. And sometimes they just put whatever they like uh, into terms of democracy. They just say, I like equality, that is democracy, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I wonder now, um, maybe you've heard there is a musical called Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. in the United States going on, and as I've heard, it's extremely popular, and it's a musical about the founding fathers, founding father of the United States. And in fact, it really um, shows uh, people how, um, I mean, not should perceive democracy, but how it all uh, started. And maybe this is this could work as an educational project. And I wonder what's your opinion on it? Whether it would really work like this or not? People would just enjoy the show in Broadway or not? I mean, what's your opinion about it? Well, I have to say, um, that thank you for your question. I don't know a whole lot about it. I haven't seen the show. So it would be difficult for me to, to comment on that. But maybe since you, uh, I'll riff off of something that you mentioned about an educational effort. Um, I've spent a fair amount of my career doing research on political socialization of youth, the role of, of programs in schools to teach American children about politics, developments uh, in support for democracy, and so forth. Um, and what it seems to me is that the, the public school system, which, while it ostensibly ought to be teaching children about the various forms of government and their strengths and weaknesses, is really a marketing campaign for democracy in the United States, as you would expect. And as other countries, uh, public education systems are marketing campaigns for whatever form of government they happen to have in place, I would say. Um, my sense, though, is that I agree with you, people, people use the term democracy as a, as a Rorschach test. They apply whatever they like, maybe, and, and uh, put it there. Uh, and then maybe they see a failing in democracy. Maybe because they see income inequality, they think democracy means equality and in income. Um, so as I present here, I don't mean to suggest a normative, a any taking of a normative position about what is, are the appropriate components of democracy or not but merely to highlight those that, to try to explain these anti-democratic attitudes by the characteristics of the people who hold them, and to try to understand how candidates may be using those characteristics to, I'll just be blatant here, my fear, to fundamentally alter the nature of uh, the political system in a country. Show my cards a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and then we'll go here. Okay, just very interesting. Well, let me put a different twist on this. I know Roberto's work, I have a lot of respect for his friend, but I really don't believe that people actually want to give up democracy and go to an authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. So let me suggest an alternative way of looking at the same thing. One of the things I'm sorry, could you talk into the microphone, please? Turn it on, yeah. One of the things that I always talk about when I teach a course in Congress is that people want their representatives to be representative, to present them again. And that means that what they don't want their representatives to be is going Washington, being too much out of touch, being a an unrepresentative elite. And I think that this may be part of what you see in these measures of people thinking that democracy has failed. That you have Hillary Clinton hanging around with Paul McCartney and a whole bunch of other people and Jimmy Buffett. And it was just a story I just saw right now that that's what she's been doing. And getting her support from people who don't look like ordinary Americans. And I'm just wondering whether this could be the source of some of the conflict going on, people saying, they just don't look like me anymore. They don't think like me, they're out of touch. I think it's an interesting question. Um, I'm old enough to know that this is a common critique of politicians. In fact, yeah. one of the arguments why George Herbert Walker Bush lost the 1992 election was because he was out of touch, because he didn't know that grocery stores had electronic scanners yeah. for their products, because he doesn't grocery shop. So I think this, 
while I'd like to, uh, to think about your idea more, I'm not immediately convinced because the trick is in the US as well as in Europe, we're watching declines in democracy, whereas the sort of suggestion that you're making is, a, is I think a long-standing critique of our politicians as elites. So while I think it may play a role, I think it certainly isn't the the only or maybe dominant factor because of the broad trends in the Journal of Democracy article in our CNAP data in the US and, and beyond. I think there is something more. I also think, you know, while Bernie Sanders could be taken as he's not the elite or a Joe Biden is not the elite, certainly Donald Trump is also among the elite. In fact, he's one of the rich people that was paying Hillary Clinton <laughs> the uh, campaign contributions. So I'm not, not entirely what do you mean convinced. By decline in democracy. That's what Decline in support for democracy, including some of the questions that I yeah. put up here when I compare them to data from 1994, there are significant declines there. And then again, finding that this is replicated across multiple other sources of data and multiple other established democracies makes me at least first blush in response to your question, not convinced that it's something that's peculiar to these candidates in the United States at the moment. But I can't believe that Americans or French people or Brits or Canadians or whatever really would go and say, I'm ready to go for an authoritarian state. Not to be flippant, but if you get out and you talk to people who aren't like you and I, you might start to believe it a little more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately. Chip is pointing to there is, you know, cross-national trends and in so that are and it's but something's going people on people right? don't realize what they're supporting they, they may Me? they may just be I, I i agree with you that's because i think we've had a problem in educating them about what you know you know what this the, there's a the, the saying right be careful what you wish for yeah i think that may be true in the united states but i don't think that means that people are not wishing for it uh, we had a, we had another question. So I and want it's to make relatively easy to fall prey to populism, which is seems to be ruling the world currently. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to make sure we get some more questions. And yes, just go ahead. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Uh, I just wanted to add up a little bit about this cross-national trend of uh, feeling disillusioned by democracy. Uh, we also study a similar thing about the Arab countries on the Arab barometer data, and we also see a great dissolution with the Arab Spring in the current uh, wave of the Arab Spring. Uh, and there was a, a very interesting, a, a little bit similar story there. They've been asking, like Mark Tesler was asking uh, in the survey, like which country exemplifies a real democracy for you, like a contemporary country like do you think Saudi Arabia is a democracy, Iran, United States, Lebanon, like something like that? What do you think of such a measure? Could, could it be a measure for the United States uh, survey or no? Uh, and uh, another question more like, uh, okay, we, we see that people are disillusioned and we see that by those candidates who are, who are winning, but uh, can we, can we see from the polls what do people think where to go? Uh, is there a way of uh, finding a new model or, or people feel that it's better to go, to go back to like classic democracy, to the old school democracy? Like what, what is the next step? Thank you. Ex excellent questions. Um, to your first question, whether uh, asking something like the question in the, in the Arab barometer would be useful for the United States, I think so. Um, I think that like many terms, like many symbols, um, maybe the term democracy can be co-opted. Uh, people alter the definition. I mean, even in, in some sense, uh, you know, the United States is not a democracy democracy. It's a representative democracy or a republic or something like that, right? So, um, so Americans maybe have co-opted the term democracy in, in some sense as well. Um, I think my point is that, and I think building on the Journal of Democracy piece, is that it is a real call that Americans uh, or those studying comparative politics should not imagine 
uh, American exceptionalism or uh, consolidated democracy exceptionalism. It can happen here sort of things. We shouldn't ignore asking questions in some countries because we think uh, there will be no variability. I've learned, I've learned my lesson on that part in any case. Um, with regards to the where do we go, uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Are, are, you, are you asking what alternative forms of government might people be looking for? Um, I'm not sure that I could speak with any expertise on that except to say that in, in some of our data, even back in 2012 in the United States, we do see some inklings of theocracy and te technocracy. Right? Um, and people, I mean, it, there appears to be some coherence in that. The sorts of people who are endorsing certain sorts of views suggest there's some veracity in those responses, that they, they have thought a little bit about them at least because they're endorsing different definitions of democracy. Um, but again, I think it calls to the need to start asking these questions and looking at the answers. There's not enough work that's been done on this yet, uh, specifically in the United States. Thank you. I just want to echo Chip's uh, point, and this has been something that's discussed at the International uh, uh, Political Science Association meeting in Poland, is, is American exceptionalism, which from Amer Mary American scholars, is it dead or not when it comes to the idea of democratic attitudes? Is the, the, the um, uh, cultural and political trends you see in Europe and elsewhere in the world, the United States is not necessarily exceptional or um, uh, immune to them? So that's something I think is a what take away from Ch Ch uh, Chip's uh, paper. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I I actually find the um, waking up of Americans and Western European scholars to populism a uh, uh, interesting phenomenon. Um, coming from Latin America, I just can't help to wonder: Is this a consequence of the two thousand eight uh, collapse, right, of the financial crash? Was there, and, and it'd be interesting, I say this because in Latin America we've had this populist wave, right? Um, and which had consequences, but unlike the United States, the Latin American constitutions are easier to modify in a way um, if you have popular support. Um, so we had our, 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 our string of populist uh, and authoritarian backlash. Um, but it was all because of economic crisis in the 90s, right? A consequent, uh, subsequent economic crisis. I wonder if this, that it's happening in Europe and the United States could be explained because of that. And I guess the, the easiest ex way to check would be what happened in the previous crash in the US. Did mm -hmm. support for democracy fall? Or did political elites react differently? Because there's, there's two possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. One is that the political elites exploited uh, the crash in a populist way, and the other one is that they sort of didn't, and you, that did not transfer to the, to the citizens. So I wonder if that would be a possible explanation. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating idea, and, and uh, maybe offline I would like to have a conversation with you in, during the break, because a month from now I'll be at the, the Waypour meeting in Latin America and Monterey, Mexico, comparing <laughs> the United States to the Latin American countries that we have in the Comparative National Election Project, and, and so uh, I would appreciate some of your insights there. But yeah, I think that's a... It's a useful thing to, to consider um, in the data that I've been examining because they're the data I'm involved in gathering. Um, we don't have enough data points probably to answer that about the United States, but obviously there are many other data sources out there that could answer that question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, quickly, because I just want to give her a chance to. What we have from what Olga said, and what you said, a little bit of a contradiction. Okay. With the rise of populism, that's sort of the opposite of not favoring democracy. It's where people want to have democracy at the grassroots. It's where they want to have referenda. It's where they want to have um, di you know, more direct personal control. So I think you need to think about that. And one other thing, just very quickly, you should look at was well, some of the questions about experts that um, John Hibbing and Beth Theismorse had in their book Stealth Democracy, where they ask people, do they want to have experts rule? And not that many, if I remember correctly, they'll kill me if I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think that many people wanted experts. Mm -hmm. hey, um, I, I will absolutely take a look at that. And I appreciate you, you 
it, what you said triggered something that I, I left off at the end of my talk, if I could just really briefly point out. Um, the reason why I didn't put any partisan or political or ideology variables up is that in the 2012 US data, this is absolutely not an ideological phenomenon. The support for non-democratic forms of government is equivalent between people who voted for Obama in 2012 and people who voted for Romney in 2012. It's equivalent for liberals and conservatives. So this is, it's not a US left-right partisan thing and that explains why we had this come up on both the left and the right in a, in a populist sense. And that's yeah. absolutely true. If you go back to Canada, you had populism from the New Democrats, the Socialist, and Social Credit, the very right-wing mm. party. So yep. same Great. thing there. Thank you. Uh, we have another question Sorry. over here. Actually, you answered part of my question that was going to be, what's the relationship with partisanship and attitudes toward democracy? So I'll just ask my second part, and that is, uh, what is the relative explanatory power of partisanship in explaining the attitudes uh, that you talked about versus attitudes towards democracy? What, what holds more? So that's not something that I've looked at yet. Um, this is actually a work in progress. Again, it's the, it's the first component of then pulling together in the next month the Latin American data as well. So uh, I have the answer for the first part of your question that you didn't need to ask. I don't have the answer for the second part. Um, but I think it would be a very useful thing to take a look at, obviously. Yeah. And I'll just say that in um, our next session, which will be in a few minutes or at five o'clock, we actually have data from Mexico that takes a look left, right, and then also how value change and support for democracy is associated with that. So if you're interested, I, um, we have a presentation in that session. Um, I'll just say one thing that's come up in discussions, I know at uh, IPSA and with other colleagues as someone who studies democratization and, and this issue, I think uh, the question is, how much of this is economically driven versus culturally driven? That is an ongoing debate. I know at IPSA there was a really good panel that talked about this as a not an economic factor, but more of a uh, post-modernity versus modernity type of cultural influence that people are rebelling against a post-modern uh, democratic culture of, of that's multicultural um, versus it really being a, a, an economic crisis, or is maybe they're interacting with each other. The economic crisis yeah. interacts with, uh, uh, amplifies possibly a resentment over post-modernity. So it doesn't think, have to be one or the other. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I'm just saying that these are two. Uh, it's interesting to see which one is playing what, and they might be different explanations in different countries. Certain countries might fall more prey to economic uh, uh, populism versus others might be more post-modernity or cultural populism. So I think that's something from a comparative question to take a look at. Um, I think uh, we're, we just have a few more minutes. Um, is there any questions for any of the panelists? We have about five minutes left before our session ends at 4.30. Are there any final questions of any of our three panelists before we end our session? Okay, well, I want to thank you all for uh, some great presentations and food for thought, which is why we're here. Um, uh, and uh, I hope to see all of you for our second session at 5 o'clock down on the uh, uh, fourth floor where we'll be talking about election data from Venezuela, Iran, and Mexico to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>